Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Mahsa Hijari, and I'll be your host this evening. On behalf of RMIT Culture and Sydney Peace Foundation, I would like to welcome you to the 2023 Sydney Peace Prize Lecture delivered by Nazanin Bunyadi in Melbourne. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting tonight, the people of the Woi Wurrung and Boon Wurrung language groups of the Eastern Cooling Nation. I acknowledge that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are the traditional and only custodians of country across Australia, having survived genocide, disposition, and colonization. I recognize their continued connection to land, waters, and culture, and pay my respect to their elders past and present. Sovereignty has never been ceded. This land always was, and always will be, Aboriginal land. By sharing remark remarkable stories of vision and courage, the Sydney Peace Prize reminds us that a peaceful, equitable, and just world is possible. This event has also been made possible with the support of the Wheeler Center, Amnesty International, Future Women, and the Victorian Women's Trust. We thank you all. RMIT is honored to join all of our partners to bring this year's prize winner to a Melbourne audience. Our MIT culture and the Winner Center have nurtured a meaningful partnership in recent years and are delighted to continue to work together to share and explore ideas and a deep commitment to gender equity. I was born in Tehran, the capital city of Iran, only eight years after the Islamic regime took over the country. I was privileged to leave the country voluntarily at the age of 17 moved to the US and migrated to Australia in 2012. Although I have lived outside of Iran for most of my life, the injustice people of Iran continue to experience, especially women, is deeply concerning for me. Mahsa Jina Emini's death last year was horrifying in many ways and acted as a wake-up call for millions of Iranians both inside and outside of the country. When I saw the video footage of where she fell down, unconscious, I immediately recognized the room she was in. I was arrested by the morality police when I was visiting Tehran in 2019 and was taken to the same detention center where I was um, treated like a criminal. They took mock shots of me in front of a whiteboard, stating the time and location of my arrest and the crime I apparently committed, which in their opinion, the gown I was wearing, which is part of the dress code, was not long enough. And I just want to ask you, can you imagine walking around Berk Street Mar here in Melbourne and having to worry about being arrested because of what you're wearing? I know it sounds absurd, but that's what women in Iran have to worry about every single day as soon as they leave home. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of all the unjust and demoralizing laws that exist in the constitution developed by the Islamic regime. This is why when RMIT asked me to host tonight's event, I accepted the offer in a heartbeat. Tonight's lecture is especially important given the injustice people are currently experiencing across the world. Killing of another teenage girl in Iran by the morality police just a few days ago the failed worst referendum for Australia's First Nation people, and the conflict in the Middle East and elsewhere. And now, let's talk about the reason we're all here tonight. The Iranian-born actress, Nazanin Bunyadi. She has had an impressive on-screen career, including leading roles in The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, and Homeland. But it's her major role as a human rights advocate that has led her to most recent recognition. Over more than two decades, Bunyadi has worked tirelessly to elevate the voices and the struggles of Iranian citizen activists fighting for the country's democracy and freedom, particularly for women and children. She has advocated at the highest levels, including the UN Security Council, the US Senate Human Rights Caucus, and the British Parliament. 
In June, Boniardi was awarded the 2023 Sydney Peace Prize for lending a powerful voice to support Iranian women and girls and their woman life freedom movement, and for using a high profile platform to promote freedom and justice in Iran. After we hear from Nozanin, there will be some time for us to ask some questions of her. I will begin with a few questions of my own, my own and um, we will hear from the audience via slider. If you are interested in submitting a question, please use the QR code behind me up on the screen there, and um, which will take you where you can upload your question. You can also follow the URL above the QR code or simply search slido.com and Nozanin's name. I know you are all waiting to hear our keynote speech for tonight. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Nozanin Bonyadi to the stage. Good evening. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm very grateful. Thank you, Massa, for that lovely introduction. And I'm very grateful to RMIT Culture and the Sydney Peace Foundation for the opportunity to be with you in Melbourne to talk about democracy and women's rights. I feel particularly inspired being here, knowing that Australian women were among the first in the modern world to win the right to vote and stand for election. Throughout history, women have played an integral yet frequently overlooked role in shaping democratic movements globally. From Emmeline Pankhurst and the UK suffragette movement to American civil rights activist Rosa Parks and trailblazing women in Australia, such as Vida Goldstein, Nellie Martel, Gladys Elphick, and Faith Bandler, who demonstrated the power of women's voices in shaping democratic systems, inclusivity, and equal representation. Women's participation has been historically pivotal in driving social and political change. And for the past four decades, the women of my homeland, Iran, have been tenaciously leading that charge in what became the first women-led mass uprising in Middle East history over the past year. As you may know, Iran was gripped with protest after the murder in custody of 22-year-old Kurdish Iranian woman, Massa Jina Amini, who was arrested for inappropriate hijab by the so-called morality police. Massa was not only a young woman, but also a member of persecuted ethnic and religious minority groups. Her killing ignited a fervent demand for justice under the banner of woman, life, freedom the battle cry of the revolutionary protests that shook the foundation of the Islamic Republic and reverberated across the world. Three simple words that serve as a declaration of opposition to the misogynistic, murderous, and repressive Islamic Republic regime. Women have been both the spark and the engine of these uprisings despite the threat of unspeakable assaults on their minds, bodies, and souls, young schoolgirls have removed their mandatory head covering while chanting, we don't want an Islamic Republic. The centrality of women in this movement matters because high levels of female participation make mass movements more inclusive, nonviolent, and most importantly, likely to succeed. From Brazil, Argentina, and Chile to the Philippines and 1980s Poland, history has, and social science scholarship have shown us that there is a direct correlation between the success of protest movements and the participation of women. And when women are on the front lines, movements are likelier to lead to a more egalitarian outcome. While women's rights triggered the protests, Massa's killing galvanized a broad-based pro-democracy uprising. Today, millions of diverse Iranians recognize that the status of women and girls is inextricably bound to the inclusive democracy they seek. 
And it's not just women protesting. In the aftermath of the 1979 revolution, few Iranian men showed solidarity as the Islamist regime ransacked the rights of their wives, mothers, daughters, sisters. But since last year, they have stood alongside Iranian women against a gender apartheid regime that maintains power by silencing everyone who doesn't share its intolerant ideology. Indeed, the vast majority of the protesters killed over the last year have been young men. The movement's rallying cry, woman, life, freedom, has captured the national aspiration. This unity terrifies a regime built on the institutional oppression and segregation of women. This is why leading Iranian women's rights activists and global lawmakers support efforts to codify gender apartheid as a crime under interna international law. Apartheid is currently only recognized as a crime in the racial context. The Islamic Republic's systemic misogyny is one of its central pillars, and as the UN Special Rapporteur on Iran, Javad Rahman, has clearly expressed, elements of gender apartheid are enshrined in both the Islamic Republic's criminal and civil laws. Current international legal conventions do not cover such state-driven gendered abuse. This must be remedied so we can hold the regime to account. Iranian women are among the very few in the world who have fewer rights than their grandmothers did five decades ago. One of the first acts of the revolution's leader, Ayatollah Khomeini, when he took power in 79, was not just to impose the forced hijab, but also to reverse women's rights in marriage, child custody, and divorce. This included lowering the legal age of marriage for women from 18 to nine. Girls that young can still be married in Iran today. Although tens of thousands of women demonstrated against the new government's compulsory hijab ruling, their cries were met with threats and violence. Among the bravest of these women was Dr. Farrokh Ru Parsa, Iran's first female cabinet minister and a pioneer in women's rights, one of my personal heroes. Before being executed by a firing squad a year after the Islamic Revolution, Dr. Parsa wrote to her children from prison that she would rather receive death than live under the shame of forced veil. She wrote, I'm not going to bow to those who expect me to, re expect me to re express re regret for 50 years of my efforts for equality between men and women. While Dr. Parsa was a trailblazer of woman life freedom, millions of micro acts of courage have led us to this day. To be clear, woman life freedom is not just about draconian dress codes. But the compulsory hijab has become the symbol of the Iranian woman's struggle since it was imposed 44 years ago. For four decades now, women in Iran have not only been fighting against compulsory hijab, but also for the right to choose what they can study, what jobs they can hold. Their testimony and inheritance is worth half that of a man. Women are forbidden from becoming judges or president. Despite this, women are more educated than men in Iran both a testament to their tenacity and a driving force in their fight for freedom. But the bitter reality is that the Islamic Republic is an apartheid state for women who are segregated from men in the workplace, in classrooms and at beaches, are banned from attending sports arenas, riding bicycles and singing solo in public and have to sit at the back of the bus. Women in Iran have no laws to protect them from gender-based violence. According to the World Economic Forum's 2022 Global Gender Gap Report, Iran ranks 143rd of 146 countries. It's hard to believe that women in Iran won the right to vote nine years before the women of Switzerland. Or that the country once had a revered national ballet and regionally renowned female pop artists. In my 15 years of advocacy, I've constantly been advised by members of the human rights community that human rights 
and democracy activism must not be conflated. Here's why I disagree. If the pillars of a system ensure its wrongs cannot be made right, the pillars need to change. And that's exactly what the Iranian people have tried to do nearly once every decade for the past four decades. But neither the student protests of 1999, the Green Movement of 2009, or the bloody November protests of 2019 compare in fervor or magnitude to the protests of the past year, which have been the greatest existential threat to the regime they've ever faced. Since the inception of the revolutionary woman life freedom protests in September 2022, hundreds of protesters have been killed, tens of thousands arrested, several have been executed with dozens facing the gallow, gallows, and thousands of Iranians blinded, raped, gassed, tortured, forcibly disappeared. And the world has moved on as it seems the country's brutal security forces have yet again crushed the uprisings. And history repeated itself on October 1st of this year when 16-year-old Armita Garaband entered a coma after being assaulted on the metro by the morality police. Days ago, it was announced that she died. To prevent a repeat of last year's widespread protest, the regime has banned all reporting on Armita's death and cracked down on her funeral. But what the regime doesn't seem to understand is that with every injustice, it stokes the flames of resistance. While the streets may not currently reflect this, the revolutionary fire is very much ablaze in the hearts and minds of Iran's embattled protesters. Female journalist Nazila Marufian continued to defy the regime despite multiple imprisonments by sharing a photo of herself without the compulsory hijab every time she was freed. She recently escaped Iran. Countless families seek justice for their loved ones despite threats and harassment, including Mahmoud Mulayrad, the mother of nine-year-old aspiring inventor Kion Pir Falak, who was brutally killed by the Islamic Republic forces. She reportedly lives under house arrest for daring to hold this regime to account. Dozens of Iranian female athletes have competed without compulsory hijab. Recording artists have released protest anthems. Prominent actresses have publicly removed their veils, even sacrificing their careers to fight for this cause. And hundreds of thousands of Iranian women continue to flout the compulsory hijab in major Iranian cities as I speak. Despite a nationwide security clampdown, increased arrests, snap checkpoints, and university purges, the recent one-year anniversary of Massa's killing saw Iranians rise up yet again, demanding an end to the Islamic Republic. Because woman life freedom is more than just a viral hashtag. It's a cry not only for women's rights, but for representative and accountable government. To best express the power of this movement, I'll leave you with the testimony of an Iranian woman in her 20s from a small town in Iran's Azerbaijan province region, made available by the Abdurrahman Buruman Center for Human Rights in Iran and being shared for the first time. She said, I'm a student who was born into a very religious family. Throughout my life, I've aimed to be independent and not rely on them. My father always liked to force the hijab on me, make me wear a chador and pray. I cried a lot in my teens, but I also realized that the problem was bigger than my father and grandfather's beliefs. I was in touch with friends and relatives outside Iran and I could see that there's a world of difference between my life and theirs. This is why I made an effort to study and get into university, to get out of the small town full of ignorant religious bigots. I wanted to do whatever I could to get out of Iran or, or live in a joyful and free Iran without this corrupt regime. It's fair to say I not only believed in the mantra, 
woman life freedom, but I also embodied it. A few years ago, when I lived in Tehran, I was arrested by the morality police in the very place Masa Amini was arrested. I was wearing a scarf that covered my neck and a big winter hat. Not a single hair was showing. I had a long, loose overcoat. But the moment I left the metro, the morality police rushed towards me like they'd seen a serial killer. They said, what is this Western attire you have? Don't you know that this is an Islamic country? Are hats customary dress in our country? I responded, what are you talking about? I'm fully covered. You can't even see my neck. They pulled me down on the ground and dragged me to the van as if following a script. In the van, I was so angry, I took my hat and my scarf off to defy them. One of them slapped me in the face so hard that I felt electricity through my head. In the detention center, I kept asking, why are you causing me stress? I got slapped again. I asked, why are you beating me? You don't have the right to beat me. I've done nothing wrong. And they beat me again. One kept hitting my forehead and another one the back of my head. That is why Massa's death resonated with me. It could have been me in Massa's place. So I felt I had to go to the streets and protest. Then they shot me in the eye and I lost my vision. A week before I was blinded, I was arrested again. I was held with scores of other women in a detention facility and they were so violent with us. They brutally beat us several times. But when I was freed, I went back to the streets to protest. On the day I was shot in the eye, there had been a call for protests and people were set to gather. I saw the special force officers shoot at passers-by with paintball guns. They wanted everyone to move along. Move, put your scarf on. Why are you standing? If anyone stopped or gathered in groups of two or three people, they attacked them with batons. Seeing Innocent people beaten just for standing filled me with rage. After a few hours, I made my way deeper into the city center. The special forces had closed off the sidewalk to control anyone passing. No group had formed and no one was chanting slogans. I attempted to get past them. I didn't have a head covering on and my shawl was on my shoulders. Suddenly, a brawny officer shoved me from behind, spewing vitriol. I felt a sharp pain all through my neck. I protested, why are you pushing? I'm just passing by. I stood and argued, are you really that afraid of people with empty hands? A few agents joined in and started to insult me. They were really foul-mouthed and vulgar. Suddenly, a plainclothes agent began firing paintball bullets at me at very close range. Several paintballs hit my body. They really hurt, but I held my ground. He screamed, leave, unless you want a shot in the eye. I got really scared. I turned around and walked away. I had barely walked 10 meters when the pain from the paintballs made me collapse. A few women came to get me to safety and to a doctor. Still on the ground, I lifted my head and saw two women being dragged away on the asphalt. I shouted, let them go. Where are you taking them? The same agent who had threatened me a few minutes earlier approached and this time, without warning, smirked and aimed at my eye. He said, you won't leave? Here you go, and fired. It happened so fast, I didn't have time to cover my eyes with my hands so that at least I had my fingers shattered instead of being blinded. This incident has caused me a lot of hardship. Now I run into walls and passes by on the street at least a few times a day because I can't see on one side. 
bathing has become a big problem too. I, every time just a little bit of water gets in my eye, it really burns and hurts. I use layers of pads and bandages to shield it, but water still gets in. Bathing is not relaxing anymore. It's a daily source of stress. But the hardest to bear is the fact that the Islamic Republic is still standing and we are still shackled. It would have been easier to bear the suffering forced on me if they were gone. It would have been worth it. This isn't the life I deserve, but we can't retreat. If we do, we've given the Islamic Republic what it wants. So we must remain strong in the face of this regime with all our strength, with tooth and claw if necessary. We are destined to be powerful. This testimony is just a glimpse at the daily indignities faced by women and girls in Iran for the past 44 years. The Woman Life Freedom Revolution has shown us that the fight for women's rights and democracy is inseparable. Representative and accountable government can only be achieved when the rights of half a nation's population, women, are fully realized. Thank you. Thank you, Nazan John, for um, your very insightful thoughts um, and also the stories from Iran. I personally, a lot of the things you said resonated with me and I'm sure it resonated with the audience here tonight. Um, you were born in Iran and um, you continued your connection to the country, to the culture, to the people of Iran. Um, and at the same time, you grew up in the West and you're well respected there. You have a huge platform there and you really are in a very unique position to create a dialogue between the two worlds. Um, and you've been around the world since last year um, with everything that happened, woman life freedom movement, and you've talked to a lot of people around the world. In your perspective, um, what, is, what are some of the things that people still don't understand about Iran, about the people of Iran, and um, specifically Iranian women? Thank you, Massa, for being here. And it's, it's really good to be able to be with you all this evening. Um, I think the number one thing I realized is that there were so many myths. Um, for the 15 years that I've been doing this advocacy work, you know, for human rights in Iran, um, well-meaning progressives would often tell me, you know, we can't touch the, the, the compulsory hijab issue because, it, because of cultural differences, for example. What the brave women and people of Iran have done for the past year has thoroughly debunked this myth. You know, now when I talk to lawmakers, progressive lawmakers, they understand because uh, the Iranian people have proven that the Islamic Republic's despotic culture is not theirs. They are risking, they have risked their lives to prove that, that they don't want to be forced to be veiled. No cultural norm requires the threat of death, requ requires to be imposed through that threat of death. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so my next question is about Again, uh, the woman life freedom movement. You know, historically, women's mo women movement have um, privileged a specific group of women, um, often leaving behind minorities such as women of color or courier women. What has been your experience in woman life freedom movement? Um, and from your perspective, what's the responsibility of such movements around the world towards minority groups? There's a huge responsibility because essentially you can't separate uh, women's rights um, 
or gender equality from from any other you know uh, oppressed group you know uh, or disenfranchised group marginalized group um, and I think the interesting part is and as I said in my, my remarks um, that Massa was not only a young woman she was a member of religious and uh, ethnic minority groups and that really helped galvanize Iranians mm. to understand that this was not just a young woman, this is uh, a, a member of an ethnic minor, Kurdish woman, this is a Sunni woman, and it did galvanize all those groups to understand that this is something, this kind of oppression happens to, to across such a broad-based range of Iranians. But also that essentially anyone who disagrees with this regime's intolerant ideology or is deemed a threat to this, this regime is threatened um, or is disenfranchised. So in that sense, I think there's a real, real unity among Iranians that recognizing gender equality will help them achieve democracy. Yeah, great. Um, so your message throughout Woman Life Freedom Movement has been a message of unity, as we just spoke about it, and working together to free the people of Iran. Um, the Woman Life Fre uh, Freedom Movement was a very unique case that it had a lot of backing from the man in Iran, from the man in Iran. And this is especially interesting given how Iran is perceived as a very um, patriarchal society. Um, what do you think the people outside of Iran can learn from this movement? The ruling elite in Iran are geriatric, intolerant, um, uh, Shia men. Um, this, is, this is a fact. That's the opposite of society. That's why we have such a vibrant, you know, essentially massa embodied and, and personified the vibrant diversity yeah. of Iran. Um, and, and it's the antithesis, the, the Iranian people, the opposite of the ruling elite in Iran. And I think that's what's shining through. If you look at the chants on the street, compared to what the, the regime says, um, it, they're, they're completely juxtaposed, right? So, exactly. so when, that's why I often say it's the Islamic Republic versus Iran, not the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, and we have to be very careful when we're using language here because when we condemn, we condemn the Islamic Republic. When we speak and pray, when we praise, we, when we say Iran and the Iranian people, we have to differentiate between these two things. And I, exactly, thank you, please go ahead. <laughs> I think it's really, really important to highlight this here because I personally, I have always been using the word Islamic Republic of Iran, emphasizing on the Islamic Republic. And it wasn't until you started talking about Islamic regime and hearing that in your speech, and I also noticed that, yeah, why, why, do, we, why do we put these two even together, the name of Iran? Because a lot of the, you know, the people, Iranian people in the audience would um, resonate with this. We have a romantic relationship with the word Iran and yes. the country of Iran. And as we always say, we, we, you know, when we leave Iran, Iran never leaves us. And we do have that very um, sensitivity to the name of Iran and whatever um, is attached yeah. to it. So, yeah, I really... Can I just add one thing? Yeah, absolutely. Just in, in, in addition to what you said, you know, we'll hear pundits and commentators say the Iranian regime. And, and my initial instinct is just... I gasped. I'm like, there's nothing Iranian about this regime. In fact, what they've tried to do is replace Iranian national identity with an Islamist one. And, yeah. and it's, it's too, it, it, you know, they're at odds. Uh, right now, that's what we're seeing is people rising up against the theocratic system. And do you, do you see that still around the world, that people confuse that, that the Iranian identity and the Islamic regime identity and how, what the Islamic regime is trying to do? Yeah, I mean, I, it's still conflated, but I think... I think more and more, and that's the, the, the wonderful, I mean, look, we have to look at the silver lining here of the past year. There's been so much atrocity, but what the Iranian people have managed to do is to wake the world up mm -hmm. to this fact that they are not their regime. Um, and what the regime says is not representative of what the people want. And, and that's what they're fighting for, is accountable representative government, which they don't have. Yeah. Thank you. And um, okay, we're going to take some questions from the audience. What can we do from here to support women in Iran? And Iranian 
in Iran and overseas are very disappointed and have no hope for change. How can we change that? Well, I'll take the second question first. No one person can change this. Um, I, what, what we desperately need is unity. I, I've been trying for the past year to, to drive the message of unity um, across the world for one simple reason. The Islamic Republic has maintained power for 44 years with its policy of divide and rule. That is the only way they've stayed in power because they understand, they're very clever, they understand that if dissidents unite, opposition figures unite, the world unites, they have no chance of maintaining power. So what do they do? They have prominent dissidents inside Iran, they pit them against each other. They, they see opposition groups forming outside of Iran, they jeopardize it. They, they, with cyber attacks and, and propaganda, they'll, they'll pit them against each other. They have been very concerted in stopping a multinational approach against the Islamic Republic at the UN level and with international lawmakers. They will prevent democratic countries from coming together and having a single policy towards Iran. Because I guarantee you, if we do, if we all proscribe the Islamic Republic as a terrorist organization, if we all find a way to end hostage diplomacy, and hold the Islamic Republic to account for its atrocities at home and abroad, they won't maintain power. So unity is really the key here. Unity is the key. I didn't get your, I don't remember the first question. No, I'll repeat the first part of it. What can we do from here to support women in Iran? That's also a really great question. I think there are many things. I say you have your voice and you have your vote. Please pay attention to who, you, uh, to who you vote for in elections, wherever you are in the world, including in Australia. And look at the policies. And we, we're very, you know, most people only um, vote on policies that, that affect them. But here's how a free and democratic Iran will affect you. We're seeing the, the havoc wreaked in the Middle East right now based on the Islamic Republic's support of Hamas. Imagine now if Iran, the Iranian people, had a, a accountable and representative government. One of their chants over the past year has been, not Gaza, not Lebanon, my life only for Iran. The only reason they say this is because they are trying to say to the regime, we don't want you to fund Hamas, we don't want you to fund Hezbollah, we want you to spend that money into helping us grow Iran, develop Iran, spend it on your own people. They don't want any part of this, the, the export of terrorism. So imagine peace in Iran and, and prosperity in Iran and what that can do for the Middle East. Imagine what that does for the world, global stability. And women are leave, leading the way. So one, one thing I say is use your voice, use your vote, and definitely use the term gender apartheid because Islamic Republic, like Afghanistan, is a gender apartheid state. We need that term to be recognized under international law, which it currently isn't. Apartheid only applies to race uh, in international law. If we can get it defined in international law, we can, uh, gen- gender apartheid defined, we can hold the regime to account. Um, let's talk about that a little bit more because that was another question about specific. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, how this can be um, codified into international crime? Yeah, um, yeah in international law. I think the, the first thing we've requested, it, the, there's a great website uh, with all the information, the signatories, Iranian, uh, prominent Iranian women and Afghan women have come together and signed on to this open letter, essentially calling for this campaign to happen, uh, for this to, to be uh, recognized under international law. Um, it's endgenderapartheid.today, endgenderapartheid.today. If you visit the web- website, you'll get all the details on what this entails. Um, but essentially, if it's written into international law, if this term is recognized under international law, then mechanisms will be put in place to hold the regime to account. And the first step we've asked for is for lawmakers to use this term. Because if we normalize the use of this term, this is where you can come in. If, if you talk about it, the more you talk about it, people take this for granted, but talking about something normalizes it. And, um, and when you hear that term often enough, and your lawmakers use that term often enough, 
then eventually it becomes uh, sort of part of the lexicon and normalizes it to the point where you can actually um, have the conversations of, of entering it and pe people can um, you know, actually have it be, become law. And are there, do you have a group of people that are working on this at the moment? Do you have yes, like Iranian, because we know, I know we've got a lot yes, of um, prominent um, Iranian Human rights human lawyer lawyers. Gisuni at the Atlantic Council in America is, is leading the way on it. The campaign is, is uh, filled with brilliant women who have been supporting it. I'm a proud signatory of the campaign. Um, but but it, the, the website will give you all the details. Okay. So endgenderapartheid.today. Great. Um, this is an interesting question as well. Do you see the Islamic Republic being removed in your lifetime? You know, the, the first answer that immediately came to my head is yes, so I'm going to say that out loudly. <laughs> um, um, look, I don't know when that's going to be. Is it six months or six years? But this is the twilight of the regime. There is no turning back. I think Iranian women and men have paved a, a one-way road to democracy and they're on it, they're marching that road. Um, and I, I, with this level of courage that I'm seeing on the streets of Iran, even now, despite every effort for, of this regime to, to stop these uprisings and brutalize the Iranian people, they keep going and they keep rising up. There will be another uprising. The question is, what are we, the international community, going to do the next time they rise up? Will we tip the balance of power in favor of the protesters and, and stop saving this regime? Yeah. And um, again, I just want to pause here. And I think it would be very interesting for the non-Iranian audience in the room to hear a little bit more about this, the, the gap between the government and also the younger generation mm. in Iran and I often when I talk to my non-Iranian friends here and I tell them that I think about 70% of the population is under 35 um, and so most of these people have grown up were born and grown up after the revolution um, do you want to talk a little bit more about that and this gap which really leads to the twilight of this regime yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think with the advent of the internet and, you know, smartphones with cameras and social media and all this technology that we now have, we are so much more interconnected um, than their parents and their grandparents. And this young generation is, is uh, leading the charge for a reason because they recognize that they, they can have a better life. And, a f and freedoms. Um, they, they know what that looks like. It's not hidden from them. It's, it's, they have access to all the things visually that we have access to. They see the way other people live and the freedoms they have. And, um, and honestly, when I talk to them, they are so much more evolved than, frankly, the youth of any democratic country <laughs> I've, I've spoken to of late. They, they understand the fragility of our freedoms far more than we do. If they spend one day here in Australia, they would never take their freedoms for granted. And it's a wake-up call for us, really, to not take our freedoms for granted. But, um, but I don't, you know, their tenacity, their resolve, you know, rap artist Tumaj Salehi recently said from prison, he made the announcement that he as long as people, these young girls like Army Togarovan, are killed for defying compulsory hijab, he will be at the forefront of these protests and he will stand by them for change. And his, the place of people like him will either be on the front lines of these protests or in prison because there's no other way for him to live. He will never be silent. And when I see men, Iranian men, standing shoulder to shoulder with Iranian women in this way, I think that terrifies this regime. You know, and that, that is why I think it's the twilight, because Iranian society is so united um, against this regime. It's only a matter of time. Exactly. And um, here's a question about, um, related to US and US politics. Do you think Trump uh, reinstating sanctions in 2018 pushed back the potential of uh, reform by closing the country off to the world once again? I think the question of reform, I think we have to be careful not to, to make um, 
the, the reason, okay, so Bill Clinton, for example, said that there's nothing wrong with America that can't be fixed with what's right with America. The opposite of that is true with a country like the Islamic Republic, the system like the Islamic Republic. Um, the very pillars of the system ensure its wrongs cannot be made right. And that's what I said in my, my remarks. I said, if, if that is the case, the only solution is for the pillars to be replaced. There's no other way to do it. How can you reform a system when its foundation stops any kind of reform from actually happening, any meaningful reform from actually happening? So when you look at it like that, then you understand that, that whether sanctions are lifted or, you know, you, you have to strangle the people who are committing these atrocities, and that's just magnancy sanctions are a must. Human rights sanctions are a must. Um, but, but really, it's not the outside world that's causing the, the lack of reforms inside Iran. It's the foundation of the system that is preventing reform. Okay, great. Um, next question. Why do you think... Um, the Islamic regime focuses so much on women and oppressing women and girls. Does fear and control of women really have that much weight in controlling the masses? That's a great question. I think if you look at history, it shows us that from 1980s Poland, Chile, Argentina, the Philippines, when women are centered in protests, pro-democracy uprisings, have a higher chance of success um, and better outcomes. Uh, and there's a reason for that, because women have a unique capacity for empathy. They include uh, sort of uh, parts of society that, you know, the care for children, for example, and uh, the rights of the child, and um, corporal punishment, and, and it extends to uh, really cover a broader segment and, and, and a more intersectional, uh, broad-based uh, understanding of society. And because of that, if you look at any auto auto autocracy, the, one of the first uh, sort of crackdowns they have are on women, on the rights of women. Um, so so that's, that fear of women comes from the fact that if they empower women, they understand that they will lose their power. Yes. Um, I think we can a lot all relate to that, <laughs> the power imbalance and how people are fearful of losing their power. Yeah. Every social change movement needs organization and networking to succeed. Is this included in your plan and your agenda for the future? Repeat the question. Um, so every um, social change movement needs organizing yeah. um, and a network of people working together. Yes. Um, is this included in your plan? Yeah, I don't, I don't subscribe to the idea that one person can go this alone. I mean, this, my whole ethos for the past year has been one of unity and you know, unity also terrifies the Islamic Republic. Unity terrifies any dictator and despot. And so I think that, that what's the antidote to their policy of divide and rule? Unite and empower. So that's what we have to do. Um, and with that comes two kinds of leadership. There's inspirational, aspirational leadership, and there's organizational leadership. Um, and I think one of the main ways we've failed in the past year has been there's been a lot of great inspiring speeches and, and moments and campaigns, but we need organization. Um, apartheid in, in South Africa ended because it was extraordinarily organized. Um, so if we want to, to create secular democracy or, or uh, empower the people to, of Iran, for secular, to gain secular democracy, then we have to organize. And, and that requires setting aside our differences and, um, and concentrating only on one thing, and that is getting to 
uh, uh, constitutional assembly or a free and fair referendum post-Islamic Republic and allowing the people of Iran to decide their future. Um, I want to ask a little bit more about that. Um, when we talk about unity, um, what do you define as unity? And as you said, we've had our differences inside Iran and Iranian diaspora around the world. We've had our differences, but there was that moment that last year, suddenly we put our um, differences aside. How can we sustain that? How can we reignite that? I think it's really important to recognize that people in Iran, when they're protesting on the front lines of these protests with, with you know, the testimony that I just read, um, when they are being harassed and beaten and raped and tortured and forcibly disappeared, they're not looking to each other and, think, and saying, hey, what's your politics? There's no time for that. They're fighting for their lives and they're doing it together. This woman whose testimony I read, when she said, hey, where are you taking these women? She didn't care about what that woman's politics were, were was left, right, monarchist, Republican. She didn't care. She said, that's my fellow Iranian. That's my fellow human being. That's a woman, another woman. And that's where we have to get to. We have to get to the point where our common humanity is far more important. And as Iranians, being Iranian is more important than what religion we have or what ethnicity we are or who we support politically. And if, when we get to that po point, when the diaspora finally gets its act together and understands the importance of setting aside our differences for a secular democratic Iran and that we can all go our separate ways once we get to the point of getting to a, a free and fair referendum and a ballot box, then that's when I think uh, democracy will prevail. Thank you. Um. I'm trying to be very um, polite and not show a lot of excitement, but it is very inspiring when we see the passion from you. Thank you. Um, Just reading through the questions, um, we've got a few new ones. Um, so if education is not enough to defeat the regime, what do you think will achieve democracy and freedom for the people of Iran? What's the question? Oh, sorry. Um, so I think the emphasis of um, the question is on um, sort of you were speaking about it a lot, raising awareness. And mm -hmm. of course, in Iran, people are um, uniting a lot. Um, what else needs to happen to defeat the regime other than speaking about mm -hmm. this is what the regime is doing, other than educating um, the international community? Um, what yeah. else can we do? Okay, so I'll get a little bit technical. Um, and, and Please do, I think <laughs> we, need, we need a little bit of <laughs> Okay. So what's happening inside Iran is it's, you know, scholars have talked about, um, sociologists and, and political scientists have talked about the conditions needed for a sex, successful revolution. Uh, Jack Goldstein, for example, has talked about the five conditions of a revolution. Two of those currently exist in Iran, economic dire straits, economic hardship, um, and the other one is mass uh, discontent and, and injustice. At injustice. Those two things are present. The remaining three are yet to be achieved. What are they? They are essentially fissures or fractures in the ruling elite. Um, another one is a united opposition. And the third is uh, international support for that opposition and withdrawal of support for the existing regime. We can't control all of those things. I, I, you know, no matter what we do outside of Iran, uh, or even maybe inside of Iran, you can't cause fractures to exist in the ruling elite. What we can do, however, is have a, a united opposition. Um, and then we can talk to international lawmakers, 
like I said, to tip the balance of power in favor of the protesters. Nobody, no Iranian I know is saying, hey, Australia, America, Canada, UK, Europe, come save us. They're all saying, stop saving the Islamic Republic regime. Stop unfreezing $6 billion in assets. Stop not being unified and listing the IRGC as a terrorist organization. Stop not having a multinational approach in host hostage uh, to end hostage diplomacy. Stop saving the Islamic Republic. So I think it's incumbent upon us outside of Iran to, to do whatever we can to A, have a united opposition, and B, make sure that international lawmakers re recognize that, that there is a, a, a united uh, group of Iranians outside of uh, Iran who echo the voices of the people inside Iran for a free, uh, a free secular democracy and ensure that they withdraw support for the regime. Those are the things that are within our power. And I think those will lead to fractures in the elite. Um, I just want to echo what you just said, and I think that should be the um, slogan of the next campaign, stop saving Islamic Republic. Yes. <laughs> you people of Iran can really save themselves. We really need to <laughs> say, stop saving Islamic Republic. Um, it's almost 7.30. Um, Nozanjan, thank you so much for um, taking the time to speak to us. Any last thoughts or last comments you I'm want just to share very, with us? I'm very grateful to you, Massa, and to everyone who's here. Please don't give up on the Iranian people. They need you. Please don't think that this revolution is, is dead. There will be another uprising. And unfortunately, there will be another brutal crackdown. It's really time for us to decide if we stand with the Iranian people or with this regime. And, um, and hopefully the next time they rise up, we stand with them and they prevail. Thank you.